It is 5.31 p.m. on March, February 14th, 2022, and I'd like to call this work session to order. Um, the first thing on our agenda is, um, in, oh, I'm so sorry, it's, it's not February anymore, it's March. It's March 14th, 2022. Thank you, Councilor Maestri. Um, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. The first thing on our agenda is going to be an economic dashboard update um, by uh, Dr. Tatiana Bailey. And to kind of cue her up and introduce her, we have Councillor Flores. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Martinez. I, I wanted to take this opportunity to just maybe tee up why we're at this stage uh, on this economic dashboard, uh, especially for the four new council members. But uh, back in February of last year, uh, we held a uh, retreat. And uh, one of the things that I thought Pueblo needed was a da an economic dashboard that really looked at a lot of a lot of areas uh, that could help us increase our economic development. And I wanted this opportunity not only to welcome Dr. Bailey, but also introduce uh, Abel Chavez, who's sitting out here in the audience. He and I have been kind of conspiring for the last 12 months in uh, helping, uh, helping me put this whole thing together. But thank you, Abel, for your help. And it's, it's not over yet. But anyway, uh, I, I would like all of you to know that uh, this is something that was put in our budget. And so currently through the legal department, we are working and uh, working out a, um, a contract between the city and Petco so that they will kind of take over the management of this dashboard going forward. Uh, we felt that that's probably the right place for it. And it's kind of a work in progress, but I think uh, that we're pretty close in putting out our first economic dashboard. And I'll stop there, but uh, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tatiana Bailey. Uh, she is an economist and uh, she is the lady that we'll be contracting with to move us forward over the next couple of years. And uh, welcome, Dr. Bailey, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, good evening. Thank you, Dennis. I appreciate that. Um, and nice that Abel is there as well. Uh, yeah, so um, thank you for having me. I, um, and I appreciate being first on, on the agenda. I think the best thing for me to do is actually just to share my screen. Uh, and in some ways, this is even better than being there in person. Um, it is a lot of information. I don't think that you'll necessarily uh, be able to absorb it all at once. There are some data pieces that are still missing. Um, for instance, uh, you know, there are some local specific things that, for instance, I was able to get for Colorado Springs once I moved here and I had some relationships and I knew, knew who to ask. And really, Dennis uh, and Abel have been my points of contact because some of the metrics um, that we'll be tracking are national, some are state, and then of course some are local. And then there are some things that are, um, a lot of things actually, that are available from government sources, either the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Bureau of Economic Analysis, State Demographer's Office, Department of Local Affairs of Colorado. Um, you know, and that's all the boring stuff, right, that the economists do and know about. And there's kind of a lot of data digging. Um, but there are still a few missing pieces, but we're getting there. And I have to give um, Dennis and Abel, particularly Dennis, a lot of credit in, uh, in the last few weeks. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of jump in and let you know, um, you know, what the data is generally saying. And what I'm thinking, um, and this will clearly be up to all of you, is if you would like me to attend a future meeting, once this dashboard is 100% complete, to you know, really talk through it a little bit more um, slowly and carefully and answer any other questions, um, we can do that. Um, because I know that when I first started presenting this to Colorado Springs, there were a lot of answers. Nobody had really compiled the data this way, um, but it was good. It was good that there were a lot of questions um, and clarifications. And um, as Dennis and Abel know, it's a tool that's used um, by the mayor's office, the county commissioners, um, city council, and a lot, a lot of businesses. Um, so I feel like it's... it's um, good fruit, if you will. All right, so 
Uh, let me get over to screen share. All right, and can you all see my screen? Yes. Awesome, okay. So the dashboard, just as a quick summary, uh, when I moved to Colorado seven and a half years ago, uh, the, the economic forum that was started by a professor and a community member uh, in Colorado Springs, um, they didn't have a dashboard. What they had was one annual event, um, kind of mimicking the CU Boulder one, uh, and one annual report. And that report is about 35 to 40 pages, good, rich information, but there are two problems with that. Number one, not too many people read 40 page reports, um, except for maybe economists and a few select people, especially today. Uh, and number two, by the time you're publishing annual data, because annual data lags, often the data that was in the booklet, um, as they called it, um, was a year or two old. Um, and I know as an economist, you know, a lot of these metrics come out on a monthly or quarterly basis. And for a community that's really eager to track their economic development, something more timely would be good. So um, I developed this dashboard, made it two pages, front and back. It's all graphs and a couple of tables. Um, and I picked out the things that I think are the most important for any community to track. You can't track everything. Um, and we did end up honing a little bit here and there, but by and large, what what you see is um, what we ended up going with. And um, I have to say it's, uh, I think people prefer two pages, let's just say that. So each section has um, a different colored background to sort of delineate it. So the first one I call the big picture. And that one is mostly national statistics. So for instance, here we have quarterly uh, GDP and this is inflation adjusted. I have the two measures by quarter. So the first one is year over year, and that's you know your little footnotes down here with the little asterisks will you know explain these things um, to you when you look at it, you know with more time. Um, and then the second one is the annualized one. So if you know quarter four were annualized over the year, the growth rate in Q for for that Q4 to Q4 of 2023 would be seven percent. I tend to focus on the first one. I like comparing to the to the prior quarter. Um, you know, no great surprise here. We had a a, a very severe um, but very short recession with a nice rebound here, and now uh, GDP is coming back down. That's that's a whole other story. Another one I track is uh, consumer sentiment. Uh, that's really important. That's about two thirds of the, the US economy, which of course we all belong to the US economy. And um, I've actually been writing a lot recently about uh, this fall in consumer sentiment. Of course, that's mostly inflation related. Dr. Bailey. Yes. Would you please mind um, zooming in on um, that page there really quickly? So that way we can- um, Be a little better? Yes, please. Is that good enough? Is that better? That's love. yeah. Okay. Okay. Dr. Bailey. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. I don't. I don't know what your screen looks like. So anyway, GDP, consumer sentiment, and then this is where I have G, uh, GMP, which is gross metropolitan product. It's the same as uh, GDP, but for metropolitan areas, right? For cities, and um, for Colorado in 2020, uh, this data is just annual, and this just came out a few weeks ago. Um, the fall in 2020 for the state was about 3%. And here's where I start doing a little bit of comparison between Pueblo and other um, cities. So you can see, for instance, uh, US on average, uh, the average city declined 3.5%. But I also brought in some other comparison cities, um, Salt Lake City, Huntsville, blah, 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 and then Pueblo um, at negative 4.1%, okay? And please also note that in all of these, I have the sources and some clarifying notes uh, often below each graph. Then over here, I have job openings, um, which as we all know, are at record, record highs. Um, this data does lag a little bit. So the latest available is January. And then in the box, I have civilian participation rate, um, which is something I talk a lot about in my presentations is 
being low even before the pandemic. And of course, it's even worse now. Um, unemployment rates here, I use the not seasonally adjusted because that, that's the only way that the data is collected for counties. Um, and it, and because it's, uh, I have regional data in here, this also lags a little bit. Uh, the January is going to be out shortly, but here you can see U.S., Colorado, El Paso County. I do keep El Paso County in here for, for you all for a point of reference. Um, and then Pueblo County, unemployment rate. And of course, these are all color coded as well. And then just, you know, because the U.S. data is more timely, um, I do include it in this text box here, and I also include something called the U6 rate. Again, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because otherwise um, I probably will use up too much of your time. Then I have inflation measures down here with CPI. I have it for the month and for the year. So as we probably all know, for February, uh, inflation at 7.9% in the U.S. And then I was able to find the cost of living index for Pueblo at 88.2% of the US. Um, this is a different source than what I have for Colorado Springs. Um, I couldn't find Pueblo, um, but you know, again, I sourced it here. Um, and then th just for point of reference, and I could include this here, 80, that's 88% of the US average, which is indexed at 100. I should probably include that in there. Okay, and then another, uh, this next section is all about labor force and employment. This is um, Pueblo MSA job openings. Um, Abel in particular is really familiar with this and, and Dennis as well, because uh, they know that I do a lot, a lot of workforce related stuff. And this is from Burning Glass MZ. This is probably the best source that's available for the job openings. Um, and you can specify any region you want. So of course I pulled Pueblo MSA here, the top 10 job openings for February of 2022. I have the, um, the title, and this is according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, categories, categorizations that they use called ONET. Um, number of job openings for Pueblo in this given month. I have the market salary. Now, the reason I don't use the Pueblo salary is because according to Burning Glass, um, not too many employers list salaries. So in order to get a larger sample size, it's better to, to pull that data for the, all, all of the US. So that gives you some idea of, of what the average salary is for these positions. And then I include also the risk of automation because I think it's important to think about the future of work. And I have the, the different categories down here. Um, and then here in this text box, now this lags a little bit um, from, you know, in comparison to the February data up here, I have uh, December, and that's because the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment, um, in order to get the total unemployed, um, it lags a little bit. Um, but I do juxtapose that to the openings of December 2021 so that um, I can give you this ratio, which I think is a really important ratio, workers available per job opening. And for Pueblo, it's 1.16. By way of comparison for Colorado Springs, it's 0.71. So we don't have enough workers for each available job. You have a slight excess of workers for available uh, jobs, not significantly though. And then here I have Pueblo County new jobs. Um, and, and these are net new or lost, right? Because if you go below zero, like we had in the Great Recession or during the pandemic, you're going to have a negative number. Uh, and this, this I track all the way back to 2001. Now, there's an additional calculation that I'm still doing right now that I do for Colorado Springs, where I add a little dotted line to say how many new jobs does Pueblo need in order to match its population growth? Um, and that's something that um, I developed for Colorado Springs, but I, I vetted it with the state demographer's office just to make sure. Um, I have some really great, fantastic contacts there, uh, very helpful people. So I'm still working on that and I will be adding that there. So it gives you some point of reference in terms of whether your region is meeting that threshold. I can tell you that in Colorado Springs, it didn't until 2014. 2014 was the first year that uh, Colorado Springs um, met that threshold. 
Then the next page, which is really the back page, I continue with this green section of local employment and wages. Um, honestly, I think this graph right here is one of the best in, in terms of understanding the composition of your employment um, regionally. So here you can see the top 12 sectors um, according to employment, okay? So this is by employment. So for instance, healthcare and social assistance is, is like in the US, your largest employer. The next biggest one is retail trade. This green one is accommodation and food, and then you have education and so forth. Hey, Dr. Bailey. Yes. Would you please mind increasing or zooming in again? Sure. Okay. Hopefully that's better. Can we do one more? Okay. That's good. Thank you. Okay. So much, Dr. Bailey. okay. Hopefully you were able to see what I was showing you before. <laughs> yeah, feel free to feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, okay, so here's the, and this is QCEW data. So this is from the Bureau of, um, of Labor Statistics. It also lags a little bit. Um, so the most recent is Q3 of 2021, but in my first couple years in, in, in Colorado Springs and going back and forth with the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are a lot of revisions to employment data. And if you really want good data, it's better to just wait a little bit and be one or two quarters behind. Um, so that's why I have this data, but I've trended it all the way back to 2015. So it's a pretty good indication of what sectors are growing and which are not. Um, and you can see, for instance, you know, construction took a hit in 2020, right? Um, retail trade and so forth. And then this box right here, these are your top growing industries from a percentage perspective from 2015 to 2021, Q3 to Q3. So transportation and warehousing in Pueblo, County, as an example, grew almost 71%. Wholesale trade, almost 40%. Professional and technical, 32%, and so forth. And again, I have everything, um, all your sources here and notes. Now, this portion down here, this is another way to look at what your major sectors are. This is your contribution to gross metropolitan product, or basically your region's GDP. Okay, so the top one was by employment, this one is by dollars, okay? So these are the sectors that um, contribute the most from a dollar perspective. And this is again, 2020 um, and it's real dollars, it's inflation adjusted. So the first one is government and government enterprises. And I have examples of that down here. Um, that's everything from postal services to airports, utilities, and so forth. Uh, finance and insurance, healthcare, manufacturing, business services, professional business services and so forth. And in 2020, your total GDP or for your region, GMP was um, almost 5.6 billion. Okay, that's the size of your economy. Now, over here in this open space from, from my dashboard in Colorado Springs, that's where we had military information, right? Because we have a large military presence. I had two graphs uh, for the number of people employed in, um, at the bases and then the economic impact. Uh, with some notes. This is an opportunity to add a couple of graphs um, or a couple of tables. Um, and, you know, that's something that you all can decide. Um, and, you know, I, I'm happy to also make some suggestions based upon that. Now, this section over here um, is the last part of this employment and wages. And I think this is really important too. This is again, Q3 of 2021. And this is the average annual wages for all industries. And what I did is I juxtaposed US, Colorado, El Paso County, and Pueblo County. And as you can see, the average wage um, is lower in Pueblo County. And I put it up here in writing for you. Pueblo wages are 22% lower than the US, 26% lower than Colorado, and about 14% lower than El Paso County, okay? And then your total employment in that quarter, in that quarter, Q3 of 2021 was almost 62,000, okay? Now, I think it's also good to know what percentage of your population is at or below the federal poverty level. Uh, well, here for 2019, the census data isn't out yet. And by the way, because of the problems with 2020 census, we might be stuck with this. Census is still trickling out things. And for some regions, they've said the sample size is, is too small and they're not gonna release it. So we'll be stuck with 2019, but it's trickling in. So obviously if I see it, I'm gonna um, update this. 
but the percentage for the US is about 12%. And for Pueblo County, it was almost 18%. Okay. And here I have the federal poverty level in 2019 was 12,490 for an ind individual and 25,750 for a family of four. Clearly very, very low salaries. And then lastly, um, I like to use this thing called the MIT Living Wage Calculator. There are a few out there. This is probably the most respected one. It incorporates what is a living wage for a given region. And they have, uh, just, I think it's every single county in the United States. And they incorporate things like childcare and average rent, transportation and so forth. So it's an approximation, but it's a pretty good one. So in 2020, I do have 2020 data uh, from them. You can see that the minimum wage, you know, in Colorado is $12. If you 12 was $12 an hour, if you any, annualize that, it's about 25,000 a year. But what MIT says is the living wage for a household with one adult, so a single parent and two kids, that person would need to make 36, almost $37 an hour, or annualized to about 76,000. OK, if you have a household with two adults and two children, but only one of those adults is working, then you um, then that person needs to make thirty one dollars an hour and roughly sixty five thousand. And the reason for that is typically you don't have child care costs if you only have one person working. And then a household with two adults, two of them, both of them working and two children. And there you have those statistics. Right. Each of those individuals would need to make about forty two thousand. OK. So that's the back of the front page. Then the second page, um, different color, I have demographics, okay? Here you have 2020, I was able to get 2020 uh, data for Pueblo County and I compared it to the US. So for instance, the median age in 2020 in Pueblo County was 40. You guys just made it over to 40. You were 39 point something last year. And the US median age is 38 point, was 38.6 in 2020. But I think it's really helpful for a community to also see it broken down by age. So you can see that for instance, Pueblo County has a little bit fewer children in terms of percentages, uh, a little bit more of 18 to 24 year olds, a little bit less of 13, or sorry, 25 to 39. Same in this age cohort, about the same for ages six, uh, 55 to 64, and then more senior citizens, 65 plus in Pueblo County, okay? And then what about projections? Well, here I have Pueblo County population growth by age. Uh, according to the state demographer's office, um, between now and 2040. And here you can see, for instance, children, you're not really projected to have growth. OK, I mean, remember, we're now halfway down this 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 um, X axis at 2020. So declining a little bit more and then, uh, you know, increasing ever so slightly. Um, the next stage cohort is the 18 to 24. And that's pretty much holding steady, declining a little bit. This is actually really interesting, increasing. 25 to 49 year olds, okay? And again, this is state demographer's office and I know Elizabeth Garner very well. She's the director there. She does a fantastic job with her staff. So, uh, you know, you got some opportunity right here in these prime working ages. And then the 50 to 64, about pretty stagnant, a little bit of growth. And then you've got, just like the US, a lot of um, senior citizens. Um, that's, that's pretty much the same rate of in increase as the US because I'm familiar with that graph. And then between now and 2050, here, this is just also from the state demog demographer's office uh, showing um, growth in each county and by color coded. So if you look at Pueblo, you are projected to increase modestly in this 20 to 50,000 range right here, right? At least you're not blue. Those are the counties that are losing population, okay? And then here are the actual numbers for the population estimates for both Colorado, okay, Colorado uh, almost at 5.8 million and projected to be at almost 7.6 million by 2050. And then Pueblo County being at 168,000 projected to get to almost 195,000 by 2050, okay? Now, 
pay attention to the little notes because here I have, I've also included for you the city of Pueblo population in 2020 city, right? Was um, almost 112,000. So most, you know, that's a lot of your population, right? Of the county. Pueblo County is estimated to grow by 16% and the US by 31% by 2050, okay? So about half the population growth rate. And that's not good because the population growth rate for the US is low, okay, between now and 2050. Then I jump over this kind of fits into this section, but it's, you know, the graph kind of landed here. Um, and this is cost of living, okay? This is uh, something called the Housing Opportunity Index. The source is um, Wells Fargo and the National Association of Home Builders. Um, there are two or three sources out there. I like this one the best. And this Housing Opportunity Index can be translated as the percentage of people who make the median wage who can afford the median priced home, okay? So for Pueblo, it's now at about 58%. But I, I went back and I looked at the 2012 data for you and it used to be 91%. This is a very common theme across the United States, but it's a lot more acute in places like Colorado. I don't have to tell you that. Okay, home sales. I've been working with Dennis. Um, I need historic data. They provided me with the most recent data on sales and I was still wasn't 100% sure on those numbers. So I'm working with them. Tess Pickerel um, from Pueblo uh, Association of Realtors um, is, is out, I think, until tomorrow or the next day. But um, I'm going to be working with her to create a trend graph for you just to look at the number of sales. OK, and I'm hoping that I can get go back, you know, five, seven, eight years. This is uh, the latest National Association of Realtors data on median existing single family home price. Um, and Q4 is out. You can see it for Colorado Springs, for Denver, and for the US, okay? Pueblo is not collected by National Association of Realtors, unfortunately. It's not a big enough MSA. So in my notes here, I included Pueblo as the, the source is realtor.com. I'm not thrilled about that, but as long as I consistently use that, I think it's okay. Um, and I also have several realtors who have told me that's not a bad source. And I also cross-checked it with some other sources and they're all kind of within that range. So if I don't get something directly from uh, Pueblo Association of Realtors, I'm gonna stick with that. If I get something from them that I'm really happy with, then I'm gonna put that in there. But you can see the percentage increases and I will have that um, for Pueblo uh, once I speak with uh, Tess. And then I have the MSA ranking. National Association of Realtors ranks home price of 190 MSAs. Col <laughs> Colorado Springs is at 30 now. It was like at 60 when I moved here, it's crazy. Pueblo, I estimated this. I took an MSA that was at almost exactly the same median price. And I stuck this in here and I put that in the notes. Okay. Pueblo ranking is estimated based on similar MSA city ranking by National Association of Realtors. And it looks like this got cut off. 190 MSAs are included, but I'll fix that. Building permits is the other thing that I'm working on. Um, and Dennis is helping me uh, to obtain. They have said that they can get me that information, but I need the historic um, and um, I think I'm pretty confident that that one's gonna come through quickly. Tourism, um, this is the last page. Tourism, um, I also need to speak with Danielle um, Kitzman. Uh, she was able to get me total tourism spending. Um, and this is quote, direct travel spend. She actually gave me the link to the Colorado Tourism Office. And that's what I have in the sources down here. Um, and this is for Pueblo County, and this is how much was spent in 2020. I need to get a little bit better um, understanding from her in terms of direct travel spend. Is, does, is that only people who are traveling here, or is that all tourism dollars and so forth? So that's still in process. And then she does not have hotel occupancy information or RevPAR, which is their, the equivalent of like how much the hotels make. Um, I get that from a local source in Colorado Springs, 
And I'm not 100% sure whether uh, Danielle's going to be able to get that. It's not something that she collects right now, but there's probably another metric or two related to tourism that we will be able to track in here. And then the last section, the last section here are just what I call additional metrics. I just got the commercial real estate information on Friday from CoStar. Um, luckily, they're able to get me that, uh, which is the same source that I use for Colorado Springs. And I'm going to have the vacancy rates and the lease rates for office, medical office, retail, and industrial. Okay. And I'm going to um, trend that. They were able to give me some historic information. Um, I just didn't, didn't have the time to pull all of that together. Um, just yet. So that's coming and that's, that is good data. Tax receipts. This is um, something I'm getting from uh, the mayor's office from the, uh, from the city of Pueblo. And this is showing gross sales tax receipts. And then in the text box here, I also have uh, the percentage increase year over year. So that would be February of 21 to February of 22. So you can see that there. I could add a trend line if you wanted me to. And then vehicle sales, I just kind of show as a, you know, a barometer of um, buying in the U.S. It's usually correlated to consumer sentiment. Um, and then I'm actually comparing to 2019 in this just because 2020 was such an off year for vehicle sales. And that's BEA, Bureau of Economic Analysis and Information. And then here, educational attainment, super, super uh, important important as well. Again, might get 2020 data, but 2019, you know, these things don't usually change a tremendous amount year to year anyway. But I have Pueblo County, Colorado, and, and uh, U.S. And this is the um, percentages of people who have some college or associate's degree. Um, and, and again, this is for Pueblo County. So you can see that for ages 18 to 24, Pueblo County is actually higher than Colorado in the US. And by the way, that's also true in Colorado Springs. And if you stop and think about it, that does actually make sense because it has a lower percentage with a batch, completed bachelor's degree or higher, okay? So that, that's part of what you're seeing. Um, and then I have the same information, but for ages 25 plus. And the reason that we have these two age cohorts is these are sort of your early completers and then these are sort of your later completers, right? Um, or maybe not completers, um, but you know, have some, some uh, level of completion for an associate's degree. And then I have the same metrics, but for a bachelor's degree or higher, right? So these would be um, you know, people with also a master's PhD um, or the undergraduate degree. And you can see it's um, you know, combining these, uh, or this is a subset of this one, right? So your total attainment level is gonna be the 23%. And then lastly, I just have interest rates for anyone who's interested. Um, and you know, most recent prime 30 year Fed funds rate, okay? Um, at the beginning, I always have at the bottom here when it was updated, okay? And then what I've typically done in Colorado Springs is, you know, obviously updated this on a monthly basis and sent it to the people who support um, the forum. So, you know, the last page, if you wanted to have a last page could be, you know, supported by, and I think I put it in here at the very bottom, um, you know, mayor's office, city council, uh, you know, whoever it may be, but those are all details that we can figure out later. And I think that's pretty much it. I'm open for questions. Thank you for that, Dr. Bailey. Um, what questions or comments are there from council? Councilor Flores. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It, uh, it... Really fast. Dr. Bailey, would you mind uh, unsharing your screen, please? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, Councilor Flores. You know, um, I wanted to make two comments. The first one is that uh, we have a lot of economic data that we get in the city. In fact, uh, our university and US Bank have an annual public forum, but this is always looking back 12 months. Uh, there's always information about how we did the last 12 months. This particular dashboard is gonna be put out every month. 
And so it's going to be really current data uh, for people that are making decisions either to moving to Pueblo or opening up an additional location or that type of thing. But what I wanted you to talk about a little bit is how communities use this dashboard to increase economic activity in the city because now we, we're going to have real-time data and uh, using Colorado Springs, I guess, as the nearest area to us. Uh, how are they using this and how uh, are opportunities created by the use of this very valuable information? Yeah, I mean, this isn't an exhaustive answer because honestly, it's a little hard for me to remember all of the different times that people have said, you know, I used it for this or I used it for that. Or sometimes, you know, people call me and say, hey, I'm writing a grant application um, and I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Um, and, you know, so, wow, uh, grants to nonprofits, grants to the state, you know, grant applications, uh, grants to the federal government, that would be one, you know, tranche, if you will. The chamber um, and even the city really uh, has often used the information to say to a business that's interested in either moving to the region or maybe expanding in the region, what a commercial real estate, you know, what's, what's happening with commercial real estate? Um, so they can look at that data. Um, you know, sometimes they say, okay, well, what are your top job openings? Um, I mean, there are, I, I would say probably the labor information is the thing that's used the most. Um, it's a little, it's something that I focus on a lot, but I think also the mayor, Mayor Southers has used that information a tremendous amount. Um, the Workforce Center, uh, even though they, have access to this data, I think they've been able to leverage it a lot more um, simply because there's a community awareness now of what those top job openings are. One of the more exciting things, um, I'm very good friends with uh, Lance Bolton, who is the president of Pikes Peak Community College, and he really honed in on the um, top job openings. And of course, you know, I, I, I have run longer reports for him like I have for ABLE that show like the top openings, um, you know, the top 30, let's say openings. And not only do you have registered nurses and nursing assistants, but you have phlebotomists and you have uh, radiologists and so forth. So he used that information to increase the number of slots, training slots at his institution. And one of my favorite things is that a lot of these, um, programs need clinicals, right? Uh, they need the students to, they get to a certain point after learning in the classroom, and then they have to actually go into a, a healthcare setting, right? And practice on real people. Well, some of that can be on um, dummies. <laughs> some of that can be on in simulation labs. Um, so he built out uh, a simulation training center on the, in the north side, not far from my house, um, for Colorado Springs. Uh, so that's pretty exciting because that enables him to churn out more students um, and they don't get sort of bottlenecked, if you will, uh, waiting for those uh, in-person uh, training opportunities. Um, gosh, let me think. I'm going to look at this and see what else comes to mind. Um, I know a lot of the nonprofits have used the poverty information. Uh, the living wage information. I've even had employers ask me about the living wage information when they were making choices. And of course, that's been more of an issue recently. Um, uh, PPAR, Pikes Peak Area Realtors, um, they use this information a lot. Um, they, uh, they actually had me do an economic impact analysis kind of based on some of this uh, information. And I recently... Uh, looked at not only what are the, I've always had what are the ideal number of permits, um, and that's going to be included in your dashboard um, as well once I have the permit information, but also what's the actual number of, of units that we are short, whether it's multifamily or single family. And I recently did that analysis, um, you know, because we know we have a national housing shortage, and that's really helpful to, to the local builders uh, to have a sense of are they quote overbuilding. Um, 
I know that Steve Posey um, at, at the mayor's office at the city um, who works on housing affordability has used the housing affordability index, the housing opportunity index that I mentioned. Um, yeah, I mean, those are some of the major things. Thank you. Councilor Winner. Hi, um, thanks for your presentation. And I, I've been for this from the beginning. I think this is gonna be very helpful for uh, lots of us in the community. Um, I was wondering if you could get us some stats on, on women's pay. Um, it's my understanding that, that um, uh, across the nation, uh, women make about 16% less than men, but I've also read that here in Pueblo, it's 41% less than men. Hmm. And um, I, I would like some information on that so that we could focus a little bit more there. Yeah, I'm gonna take a note on that. That's actually, um, that's interesting because I've done, um, actually quite a few presentations on the wage gap. And um, I've done it on national statistics. Hold on one second, I'm gonna grab my book here. Um, on national statistics, but I don't know a lot about local statistics. Um, so I can't promise it, but I can promise that I'll look into it because I think that would be interesting. If you had that on the dashboard, it makes it that much more you know, evident in the community, right? Um, especially as this uh, gets, you know, hopefully um, disseminated out to businesses. Definitely, thanks. Of course. Uh, Councilor Atencio. Yeah, I was uh, especially interested in the uh, unemployment rates for the city of Pueblo. Uh, my district is low to moderate, most of it is low to moderate income individuals. And I'm wondering what, uh, if your demographics, is there anywhere where it would show the unemployment rate for low to moderate income individuals, uh, specifically Latino, and since I'm Latino and I represent a lot of low income Latino people. Uh, I go through uh, a lot of the businesses in town and notice that uh, the, the Latino population is usually the last to get fired, uh, last to get hired, the first to get fired. And uh, not to mention that uh, they get paid a lot less than uh, other individuals. Is there any way that we can track that unemployment rate for low income people? Um, I'm also a Latina, so I, I, I like your question. Um, and I think it's a really relevant one. Uh, that is also something that I'll have to look into. Unlike the wage gap by region, that one I'm not as confident about, to be honest, but I'm still gonna take a look at it um, for sure. But I'm pretty sure that the unemployment rates um, are available. Um, probably more historic information from the census data because census is the one that often breaks things down by racial ethnic minority groups. Um, so, you know, we might have slightly dated information, but that's okay. If the table says it's 2019, people know it's 2019, but it'll still show the disparities. Um, so let me take a look at that as well. If we knew that information, we might be able to deal with that population a little bit better and, and find some solutions to the problems that are in uh, the lower income parts of town, and especially with the uh, minority uh, populations. You know, you're making me think that maybe I'm going back to the dashboard. Do you remember that I had that section that was military that is quote open space? It's gonna take a little bit of reshuffling, but maybe one thing um, would be to not only have those unemployment rates by racial ethnic group, if, if I, I can indeed get that, but also educational attainment because that's, that's where it all starts, right? Yeah. Um, so let me, let me look into both of those. And if I can find them, I'm going to plop them in here because I, I think you're right. I mean, your population is, is, is a little different. Um, you know, we have a, a relatively large Latino population in Southeast Colorado Springs, but it's not nearly the percentage percentages that you have in Pueblo. So let me see, um, what I can include there. Okay. And, um, low wage, uh, the wages in Pueblo are a lot less than other parts of the state and uh, the country. And uh, one of the reasons is that the employers in this town know that they can pay less. And uh, for those people looking for a job, 
Uh, how do we deal with that? <laughs> that's that's the sixty-four million dollar question. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting because you know Pueblo is experiencing a lot of the what I saw in Colorado Springs when I moved here seven and a half years ago, where the wages were lower. They are still lower. Um, but you know what is of course happened over over the last you know seven and a half years is that the cost of living has almost doubled here for housing in particular uh and and the wages have gone up but there's still that gap so that same table that i showed you for pueblo that showed pueblo wages are 22 percent lower than the us 26 lower percent lower than than um colorado um you know our, our gap isn't as big as yours, but it's still there. Uh, wages are very sticky, as economists call it. So it's it's a conundrum, right? Because what are you going to do when your housing costs in particular continue to climb, 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 but you've got wage gaps that are in the double digits? It, 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 you know, something's going to hit, right? A, a, a wall. You're going to have individuals. And what I worry about in particular is young talent. Because they're, you know, they're obviously the ones who don't have home equity yet, uh, you know, and, and they get hit the hardest. So I can't say that I have an answer, but I can say to you, like, you know, Dennis and Abel first said to me, you first need to have the data in front of you and you need to consistently have it and you need to have it updated so that at least you know what the what the baseline is. What are you dealing with here? How bad is the wage gap? Um, you know, and if it's if I can get the data and it's particularly large for females, that's something that should be talked a lot about, right? In city council, um, in the media, um, you know, to employers, um, and that's another reason that I think disseminating this is super super important. And I know I'm thrilled that it's used a lot and disseminated a lot in Colorado Springs. Okay, thank you very much. Just a thought: fifteen dollar minimum wage for Pueblo. You know, I don't know how it is in Pueblo, but um, in Colorado Springs, uh, you know, the, the McDonald's down the street has a big banner that says $17 an hour starting salary. Council um, Yeah, Dr. Bailey, uh, the CPI index, uh, you had, you contrasted Pueblo to the national numbers. Is there a way of, in, of uh, separating or digging deeper and uh, contrasting CPI between Pueblo, Colorado Springs, Denver, maybe even Boulder. Yeah, that's actually easy. Yeah, um, the reason I bring that up is that we lose a lot of our fire people, our police officers, uh, when they think that the grass is greener, maybe in Denver, and they're going to get a higher wage. They don't take the CPI into consideration, mm. and find out that the home they had here, they can't buy in Denver for what 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 they did here and i that data to me is going to be really important uh, because i think our cpi in pueblo is so much lower than springs in denver uh, that we need to be able to show that yeah that cost of living index that i showed you at 80 88.2 for pueblo is now at 108.6 for colorado springs and it was below 100 when i moved here so um you know that's quickly changing and um I worry about that a little bit with Pueblo too, with your housing costs. But yes, you're, I mean, definitely, you know, Denver is like I think one seventeen or one eighteen, something like that. So it is a big difference. Other questions, Dr. Bailey? I'm curious of what other ideas you had for the open space in the dashboard for Springs. You mentioned that's where you have a lot of the military metrics. Um, what other ideas did you have to fill that? Well, I think some of the things that were brought up, uh, you know, the wage gap, if I can get it by region, um, and then, you know, the unemployment rate by uh, racial ethnic group, educational attainment by um, racial ethnic group, I think that's actually really good information for you to have. And that may actually use up um, most, if not all of that space. Um, so I, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with that. And honestly, I think that once this dashboard, you know, these, you know, three, four pieces that are still missing, once it's populated, I mean, I would love for you all to talk about that. Uh, you know, how do you feel this information is going to be used? Um, and then, you know, I'm happy to listen in on that. 
and, and weigh in as an economist and, and what I've seen in other communities. Um, but, you know, I think it, it really starts to become a little more region specific. So, for instance, when, the, you know, it was brought up about these racial ethnic groups, I think that's really relevant for an area like yours. Um, building permits, you know, if, if there's concern about um, urban sprawl, if there's concern about overbuilding, all of those different things, there may be one or two additional metrics um, that we may want to stick in there. So I think a lot of it has to do with what you feel are the most uh, pressing issues. I'll also tell you that this, um, this uh, group of metrics that I have for you I think are some, are, I really do feel are the, the most important ones for you to have, you know, and, and to have uh, updated on a monthly basis. And it's been honed a little bit, even for us over the years. Um, so, you know, and then one other thing I should mention is there are one or two of these um, that I rotate. So for instance, when I showed you US vehicle sales, Every once in a while, um, I put Colorado Springs Airport in Plainments in there because I'm able to get that data as well. And that kind of just gives the community a picture two or three times a year of what's happening with our local airport. So that's another possibility. Can't do that with too many of these, but there are two or three where you could uh, rotate. And can you clarify, when is this going to go live? This dashboard? Uh, Dr. Bailey answered that. Yeah, so as soon as I get these last few pieces of data, um, it's going to it's going to be ready to go. Um, you know, so my hope is in the next two to four weeks, unless I hit a wall with one of these, but I don't think so, because um, I've got a plan at least uh, and conversations happening. And, you know, and both Abel and, and um, Dennis have been really helpful in terms of well, if this doesn't work, you know, what, what else might we do? Um, but I'm pretty confident in the next two to four weeks. Well, I look forward to talking more about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey, for that presentation. Oh, can, there, was, there was one last thing. Uh, I, I just spaced it out, and that is there's another piece to the services you'll be providing called workforce development. And I, I don't want to get into that at all because that's going to take a whole other uh, work session, uh, but that that's one thing that if you look at the graph having to do with the fact that there's 5,000 jobs available in Pueblo and they can't be filled, that we have to connect our educational systems, both our university and PCC, to be able to start training people for the jobs that are there to be had. And uh, But I, I, I just wanted to mention that, that that's something that will be part two of this dashboard and that uh, it has a lot of potential in, uh, in changing the way we do things here in Pueblo. Well, thank you, Dr. Bailey, um, for that presentation. Um, I think it's super exciting for Pueblo and I think it's gonna be a useful tool. Um, the thank next you. on our agenda is a visit Pueblo annual report update. So do we have Ms. Kitzman? and Mr. Nava to the podium. Chairman Martinez, counselors, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for allowing us a few minutes today just to come and present to you. Um, today, we're gonna give an update on Visit Pueblo and our destination management. As you know, Visit Pueblo lives uh, within the Greater Pueblo Chamber, and we serve as the destination management organization for um, all things Visit Pueblo for the city. So I'll turn it over to Danielle Kitzman, our Vice President of Tourism. Thank you. And I would just reference uh, in speaking with um, Dr. Bailey about the tourism data, uh, those, those data points that we were looking for for that ADR RevPAR information are things that I get from hotels on an individual basis. but similar to one of the other data points she has, um, we don't uh, get enough hotels reporting to, to jump into some of the bigger industry known reports like STAR, they call it a STAR report. Um, so I'm working to get a few individualized reports from some locations that she can use to collect that data. 
And then on top of that, we do have a call this week to, um, to see if we are now positioned to be on that, that global kind of report. And I think we're getting close. So, so we're working on those and, and hopefully I'll have some data for her here in the next day or two. So just wanted to start with that. PowerPoint up. Um, at any reference, uh, thank you for allowing us the, the opportunity to talk to you today about Visit Pueblo and what's been happening uh, in the last year or so. Um, as you know, tourism is big business in Colorado. Uh, Colorado spent $24.2 billion in uh, travel spending, that data point that she referenced. Um, and the Colorado Tourism Office collects this data from multiple sources. Dean Runyon and Longwoods are two big, um, well-known, reputable firms that collect that data. So that travel spending will get her that information as well of what goes into that, that data point. The state also welcomed 86.9 million visitors. Uh, the tourism industry supports 180,000 jobs in Colorado and saves $707 annually in taxes and collected 1.5 billion in state and local uh, taxes paid by visitors into the economy. <clears throat> in Pueblo, uh, the average between 2019 and 2020, travel spending was about $180 million, supporting two, a little over 2,000 jobs and collecting over 6 million in local taxes and 5 million in state taxes. We do have some data that we collect regularly uh, in conjunction with the city and gross lodging sales is one of those metrics we look at and how the uh, hotel industry is doing as a whole and indicative of what travel is doing. And uh, 2021 ended at $46 million in um, gross hotel receipts. And that's a phenomenal number that, that we, you know is record breaking. And if you break that down, the, a, the average daily rate is around $130 in Pueblo. So that equaled out about 350,000 rooms that were booked in Pueblo County. And that netted about $1.7 million in 2021 lodging tax collected, also a record high. The Visit Pueblo team provides destination management. So it's made up of a handful of things, but the um, top being advocacy for the industry, destination development, marketing and advertising, event sales and support, and then visitor services. We are members of a variety of state organizations committed to the industry. So some of the top ones, the Colorado Tourism Office Leadership Committee, uh, I'm fortunate right now to be a co-chair of that committee. And we focus on recruiting and sustaining uh, leadership uh, development in the tourism industry. Uh, the Tourism Industry Association is a lobbying firm that we monitor legislation and actively participate in uh, efforts to support pro-industry uh, legislation. One of the uh, big ones we helped with last year was the Meeting and Events Incentive Program, which passed uh, legislation allocating uh, $10 million to help Colorado keep and retain and attract um, meetings and events here in Colorado. So um, that was one of the, the the good ones, the Colorado Hotel and the Lodging Association. We are members of that and we share industry updates and standards, COVID relief opportunities. We monitor legislation that um, may impact the industry from the state level and, mid and, and transfer that down to the local level, as well as the Colorado Association of Destination Management Organizations. I know that's a mouthful, but uh, that organization um, is made up of all the CVBs in the state, similar to what Visit Pueblo is. And we meet regularly throughout the year and share uh, industry ideas, what's happening in our own communities. Um, and it's a, a great helpful organization, as well as looking at internationally, Destination Management International helps us stay in line with industry standards, trends, uh, and accessing metrics from across the globe to help us kind of manage what we do. And then on a different level, Care for Colorado and Leave No Trace, uh, we work with those, out, um, those organizations to share sustainable tourism messaging uh, for our outdoor partners in particular, uh, making sure that we are sharing messages and all platforms to, to kind of uh, travel like a local, be respectful of the place that you're traveling to. Um, one thing I just want you to hit on, Danielle, if you don't mind, uh, I know you threw out CDB as just an acronym. Do you yeah. explain what that is and what the difference between that and, and destination management organizations? Yeah, thank you. Um, Convention Visitors Bureau is that CVB term. 
and that's kind of the standard traditional. It's morphed over the last few years or probably, probably five or more into destination management. And that's because we really have a holistic approach in what we're doing in supporting industry partners in servicing events, in uh, you know bidding uh, on events, in uh, hotel management, et cetera. So it's, it's a much bigger, broader term now because of all the things that go into really um, you know, a healthy tourism industry in our community. Um, so to that point, destination development is a, a pretty broad scope and has many components, but at the core, it's um, how we work to build the public community into a tourism destination. And we do that through extensive community engagement and partnerships, some of those being listed here. Uh, the Destination Public Advisory Committee is a monthly organization or meets monthly, and that's made up of all the different attractions in town um, and uh, some, some hotels, some restaurants. And they, they, uh, we meet to just go over industry news, resources, local events, advertising and marketing opportunities. We hold workshops and classes for them from everything from YouTube to TikTok, keeping up on all the, the recent trends that they uh, need to be abreast and to um, advertise. And then we also do event consulting and support for a lot of them. Uh, right now we have a proposed public art festival we're working with, a good night barn chuck wagon rendezvous, and we just um, helped uh, support the frostbite fish off that brought 90 anglers here to Pueblo. So some of the most recent. The Pueblo Lodging Association, as I referenced, we do bi-monthly meetings with them, connecting our hotel owners and management to that, that broader state uh, messaging from the Colorado Hotel Lodging Association keeping them up to date on industry updates um, and uh, resources. And then we also work with them to do large room blocks like for Rocky Mount Street Rods and some of these events that are coming, the Pueblo Bike Classic is um, one of those. So we work with them on room blocks. Um, Pueblo Chili Rose Association, of course, uh, we support them with administrative needs, seasonal marketing and event opportunities, and then advocacy too from a legislative um, side the farm uh, farm workers rights bill was a big one last year we worked on as well as right now we put together a committee of local um, uh, farmers to uh, represent um, hick and loopers uh, uh, opportunity to review the farm bill that's coming in 2023 it's a kind of a state and a national uh, group so getting them involved so that where we have local representation as well as again to that Colorado Association of Destination Management Organizations, we really fall back on them a lot to look at in uh, statewide trends, what their um, funding is looking like. And um, so that's one that we meet with regularly. The SoCo Summit Partnership is uh, an opportunity for regional collaboration within 11 Southeastern counties. So that's resulted in um, some great resources for trade shows and um, industry updates from a region, supporting regional events and et cetera. And then visitor services, of course, operating the Pueblo Welcome Center and offering visitor services such as uh, welcome bags or welcome tables. Uh, right now we've got the transportation technology uh, conference here with 500 visitors and at 6.30 this morning, our staff was setting up a welcome table and there to answer questions all day long for them um, about how to engage in our community. So that's a regular part of what we do. Along with the destination development is uh, something that we were proud of. We were awarded the um, Colorado Restart Destinations Grant by the Office of Economic Development. That allowed us to have um, 75 hours of consulting uh, work and a $10,000 um, grant for marketing. We're still going through that process. We'll be wrapping it up in May. Out of that came some really great uh, workshops with our local um, partners and one of the pieces that came out of it was a little more advocacy and a little more talking about what we do. So in January, we launched the Visit Pueblo newsletter. It's kind of growing and, and figuring out what information goes on that. But really um, going back to that TTCI uh, conference, for instance, um, we found that communicating with our local restaurants and businesses when we have a large scale event um, is something that had there's a gap. We most businesses, restaurants are closed on Mondays and Tuesdays, particularly Mondays. So we didn't want 500 people coming into our town looking for a great place to eat, not being able to do that. So we mobilized and launched, uh, went, went out literally manpower phone calls or, and uh, collected emails and started an e-blast to get that information out to them in a timely manner so they could prepare from a staffing level. 
maybe rearrange their hours so they can capitalize on those conferences and events that come here. So that'll be a monthly publication that will be coming out from Visit Pueblo. Moving into marketing and advertising, Visit Pueblo provides um, marketing and advertising across multiple platforms. In 2021, we looked at investing more in paid digital and streaming options. Uh, we use short and long uh, form video, some fun interactive short burst videos, uh, specializing in particular things like biking or fishing, um, things like that, and then static ads throughout uh, Google platforms. Uh, that, uh, as you can see, resulted in some pretty good, um, some pretty good metrics: sixteen thousand Google searches and clicks, uh, six point nine click through rate, which is uh, double the the industry standard. Our website is performing up 10% from 2020 for visitation, of course, I'm sure that's part of the COVID trend, but 140,000 searches for things to do in Pueblo. Among those top searches were attractions in Pueblo, things to do, outdoor rec and history and culture, and 4,300 uh, video commercials aired in select Colorado markets. We also do a, a whole host of print uh, publications and um, give you a Kind of a few slides here. Um, some of the, the fun ones that we were able to secure, the no by uh, the Denver Post featured Ditch the Mountains this winter and head to Southern Colorado. The Travel Weights publication did how to spend a long weekend in Historic Pueblo. We had a Colorado Road Trip feature in Salt Lake, uh, Salt Lake City Magazine. Royal Gorge Guide did a full page feature. Denver Post as well. Thirst Magazine, a, a feature on Pueblo local breweries. And then a whole host of regular ads that we, we contract with from Colorado Love, Colorado Fun, Colorado Life, Colorado Springs Official Visitor's Guide, Colorado.com, The Gazette, The Denver Post, and then AAA Magazine also did a great Pueblo feature. Some of the other uh, marketing highlights, we were able to work with the Colorado Film Commission uh, to include Pueblo in Uncharted Adventures, which aired on um, uh, the Weather Channel, and it, uh, it incorporated some fun, like, crazy things with weather, which they, they did a feature on the PBR Sports Performance Center. So um, in 2021, we were um, invited to attend three media receptions hosted by the Colorado Tourism Office in which they position us with uh, at least 20 travel writers, bloggers, uh, everyone in the media um, for us to pitch stories about Pueblo, which resulted in some great wins like uh, the station, um, the station in on the Riverwalk being included in a New York Post feature. Um, we also nominated Neon Alley and the Riverwalk uh, to be featured in the Colorado Tourism Office International Promotion Commercial. So segments of those um, assets are being aired all across the world. And then the Neon Alley also won 2021's um, Best Downtown Place by Downtown Colorado, Colorado Inc., which we nominated them for that. So a couple of great wins there. As far as event sales and support, um, as I referenced, convention sales and servicing, we work hand in hand with the convention center regularly and other venues across the city to attract and sell conferences, events, group tours, tournaments, et cetera. Our team works with hotels to secure room blocks and negotiate uh, rates as necessary to book the events. We arrange event support and servicing from digital welcome kits on their websites during registration so they can find out about Pueblo before they come welcome bags, welcome tables, um, and uh, shuttle services, group dining options, entertainment like the River Walk, um, pub crawls, tours, and other attractions in our region, and even extends to mayoral welcomes um, that we'll book with them and you all in city council uh, welcoming some of these events. We belong to numerous organizations that support this marketing activity. Um, some of those in these, this group, tour bus operators, like Tour Colorado and ABA, American Bus Association, um, Group and Leisure Travel. We just finished Golf Expo and Go West Summit, um, marketing to uh, leisure travelers and also group travel um, from all across the country. Um, we did Meetings International, which is another meeting planner conference in Denver just recently. And those are regular, uh, kind of regular opportunities. We also host site visits and familiarization tours. Last Friday, we had a travel writer here doing um, some features on Pueblo culinary options that we took her around for a half day and toured Pueblo and a bunch of restaurants. And then familiarization tours can be from, we've done, we did one last year for Colorado Association of Realtors, bringing a handful of realtors down to look at us for a conference. 
space and then military reunion network we hosted 20 meeting planners that have a particular forte in military related events um, brought them here to pueblo to show them around for a day so some of the things we do from a group travel um, standpoint <clears throat> visitor services of course we've welcomed over 1500 visitors at the welcome center we made over 7500 welcome bags 300 new mover packets hundreds of emails um, we've dis distributed over 30,000 copies of the Pueblo Visitor's Guide throughout the state. Uh, we've hosted welcome tables in, uh, at 14 conferences, and we deliver regularly and maintain all the visitor materials in all of the uh, Colorado Welcome Centers across the state and at our local hotels and attractions. And we also uh, knew last year we collaborated with the Colorado Tourism Office and the Colorado State Fair to open the um, Colorado Welcome Center at the State Fair. So we staffed and manned that with volunteers and materials, and we provided over 3,000 um, guests with information on Pueblo and Colorado abroad. So uh, those are some of the highlights there. And last, Carol, do I just hit the button and it'll go? Just wanted to end with our latest commercial. <laughs> any questions you have thank you chamber i definitely want to visit pueblo now <laughs> um what questions or comments are there from council Councilor flores uh, danielle we've had this conversation before and uh, that is the amount of i mean our convention center now is kind of a perfect spot for small to, i guess it would, they would be small conventions or medium conventions however the terminology is but you've said several times to me that we've lost a lot of these conventions because we don't have enough rooms. And uh, I think we've talked about uh, 120 rooms. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of these we could capture. And uh, it obviously, you know, that's part of the economic development arm of the city and all of us working together. But can you elaborate a little bit about the things that the kind of calls you get and the, and the people that we, we lose or the conventions that we lose because we don't have enough rooms. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, it is unfortunate. We, we've done a great job as a community and as a city and the word is out about Pueblo and our convention center it makes us um, a, a front range uh, magnet for these events because there's not many facilities. In fact, Colorado Springs doesn't have a convention center. And the one competition we did have was the Hotel Elegante, which just recently um, is closing. And, uh, and so that sent a, no less than probably 10 immediate needs down to Pueblo of where are we going to host our event that they had already had booked out. Um, so we are positioned, uh, you know, prime for all of that business. But when it came down to it, we immediately started running on these RFPs for this Hotel Elegante business and um, immediately lost too because we didn't have enough downtown hotel space uh, to attract them. Um, we typically will have to spread out throughout the city and we try to maximize as much as possible in downtown area, but the downtown is, is um, the place to be and all the traveler, you know, the travelers want to be downtown and walkability, walk to restaurants, get on the river walk. Um, so that also poses a problem with the amount of business travel that we have uh, with expansion of Evres and all of the great developments that are happening in our community, we have a lot of business travel that our downtown hotels are locked into um, with great contracts that, that generate them great revenue and our consistent business repeat business. So when I call them or the convention center calls them and says, hey, we've got this event, we need 175 rooms in the downtown area. Um, it, sometimes that's pretty tough and there's, there's less than 400 between the two Marriott's. And they also have formulas in which they can allow how many rooms to be booked within a hotel and how many need to be left open for other markets. So we have to meet those formulas and, you know, we work with them and they are a crucial part to our success in attracting this business or booking it. Right now we have a competitive bid in front of us that we just met with, uh, met with the convention center, the Marriott's on th last Thursday for uh, 
the USA Boxing uh, International Invitational. This would bring 200 uh, top tiered athletes, athletes that just competed at um, the Olympics um, to Pueblo for nearly 10 days, between seven and 10 days. We need 175 downtown hotel rooms. And I can tell you that we aren't making that right now. Um, so we have to then uh, work within our budget to place them up at the north end or south end of hotels where we can fit them. And then we pay for shuttles to bring them back and forth. So that's part of that convention or event servicing um, part of our budget that we use to, to hold on to those pieces of business. I, I was um, at a, I had taken my grandson to get his hair cut and I was just sitting there reading the Denver Magazine. I think it's called 5280, mm -hmm. 5280. Yeah. I never realized this before, but they actually, uh, they have a graph of how much, what is the, uh, the amount of fees that they get from any park in the state of Colorado and our Pueblo Lake mm -hmm. is the highest. It's number one in attracting and providing revenue to the state. I never realized that before, but there obviously uh, there's a market there too uh, of people wanting to get on the lake for all the recreational activities there are. But yeah, absolutely. Outdoor Rec is, you know, one of the top um, attractors for tourists here in Pueblo. Of course, as we all know, our weather is amazing. So during the off season, when we have uh, fishermen and um, hiking and biking um, fanatics, they're all coming to Pueblo. We may not see them because they're camping They're you know, they're, and they're staying staying out at the lake or in other areas, but they do have a major impact on our, our community and our economy. Um, and we're doing everything we can to capitalize on that, um, that business, again, while promoting sustainable, uh, you know, tourism, the Lake Pueblos, uh, we're, we're almost getting into the over tourism, and they probably would say we are being uh, experiencing over tourism, which is something I never thought we'd say about Pueblo. Um, and, you know, when I started seven years ago, I think it was a little, little over 2 million visitors. And now we're looking at over 3 million that are coming to Lake Pueblo State Park. So it's a, it's a, a balancing act. Councilor Maestri. I visited the Welcome Center after the luncheon the other day. And um, your hostess that's here today, she did an awesome job. Yeah. She's very well organized <laughs> over there. She's yeah. very personable and she's very informative. And that was really nice to see. And by the way, I also have been recruiting volunteers for you since That's I visited. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask about um, in the lodging um, statistics that came out this year, the percentage of lodging, it was higher than normal. Um, one thing people have been asking, um, the vouchers that are given to people who are looking for a room that night or some sort of um, shelter, are those included in that statistic? Um, what vouchers are you? Using? Well, you know, if somebody's, okay. um, the church will give them oh, a voucher. Like a voucher. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't are those think... included in the statistics? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know. I mean, because with that, with, as far as I'm aware, that tracks revenue, you know, so if, mm -hmm. if they're getting subsidized from the government somewhere down the road, then mm -hmm. should be included, I would guess. Um, but they wouldn't be in lodging tax because they're they're not probably paying tax. You know, they're not paying that lodging tax portion, that 4.3. So that's a great question. Um, okay. That would be a question to follow up with the city um, sales tax uh, department to see what goes into those figures. Okay, thank you. We can get that information for you, um, Councilwoman Maestri, and we'll get that email out to you. Thank you, Dwayne. I appreciate it. I think that um, the hostess over there is Liz Chat Ch Liz Chapman, yeah. just for some public recognition for Liz. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Councillor Atencio. Yeah, and in terms of hotel rooms, uh, when is that uh, hotel on Santa Fe under construction going to be open? Do you know? Yeah, it's supposed to be open here um, not too long. I think in May, June um, was their timeline, uh, hopefully sooner. It is an extended stay. And so their model is a little bit different. Mm. Now, if they aren't in high peak season and have open, you know, an open enough occupancy, then they will um, be able, we will utilize it for convention space. Yeah. Um, so that's the plan right now. Any news on the hotel on Main Street? I have none. No news. Mayor, any news on the hotel? Thank you. Yeah, and I appreciate the comment on the visitor center. Liz just took that over um, and is doing a great job. And we um, 
we've got what Liz, I think four or so uh, volunteers now that are new. No, 10. And thanks to the, uh, we've gotten quite a few from that, um, that do the, uh, pro their tax program where they do community service for that. And we've gotten some that are great that are gonna stay. So, so we're, we're thank you for the recruiting. <laughs> Okay, I think Councilor Winner. Yeah, uh, this is kind of off subject, but uh, speaking of the visitor center, I heard you had a theft there earlier this year, uh, and some laptops were stolen and televisions. We had a TV that was missing, um, and that's being investigated and turned over to our police department. Oh, okay, okay. Nobody was hurt or no. Okay, no. all right, thanks. Um, before we. I just want to take a minute to, you know, publicly acknowledge uh, the staff at the chamber, especially the visit public staff. Um, it, it takes the entire staff at the chamber to pitch in to pull this off. I mean, not not it's not just the four people that work within that that CVB bureau um, within the chamber, but um, Danielle's done an amazing job leading that team, um, and and it's showing in the work that in the return that we're getting back um, on the on the tourism side. So, um, thank you for all of your continued support of the chamber. Awesome, thanks, Danielle, thanks, Dwayne, and thank you for the um, folks here from Visit Pueblo. If there's nothing else for the good of the order, I will adjourn this work session at 6.51.